Hello, everyone. Uh, so this is our second recorded offline course lecture for programming language SIANG 242. Uh, our chapter is abstraction, uh, which is a uh, which is an important principle in programming, uh, software development, and even engineering and other designs. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will talk about uh, the general idea of abstraction, which types of abstractions exist in programming languages, and essential part of abstraction, which is uh, parameter passing. Uh, and uh, together with parameter passing, we'll talk about uh, evaluation orders uh, and so on. Uh, so the abstraction is uh, essential when we have a complex uh, a problem we have to uh, solve uh, by dividing it into pieces. So we have too many uh, uh, details uh, in the uh, problem and uh, in order to uh, reduce the details we uh, keep uh, the useful parts, we define the interface somehow, and the details will be uh, hidden at the bottom. So uh, uh, we can only interest in useful part later. So once we finish details and make sure that it is somehow working, then we can use it with only a small uh, part of the interface. Uh, and uh, this helps us not only uh, solving the problem better, but also uh, reuse that our solution in other uh, solutions we may have, other problems we may have later. Uh, so in this way, we will uh, make our design or program use reusable. Uh, we enclose it in a body and hide the details and define the useful part so that we can reuse that useful part again and again. Uh, so the, uh, when you create an abstraction, uh, the user of that abstraction will ask you this question, how do I use it? Uh, the developer will know the details, how it works, uh, internals, the complicated parts, but once it is complete, only users uh, concern will be how it is used. So user, what does, uh, is uh, interested in, what does it do, and developer, how does it do that? Uh, and the nice thing is, after a work of development, users will have only small things to learn and use. And that design, that solution can be reused in the other parts as well. Uh, so in order to start with abstraction, we should uh, define uh, this question, uh, the separation of usage and implementation uh, of the uh, program, program segments. And abstraction is essential when your program and your uh, problem gets uh, larger, not uh, even uh, if you start getting uh, as your uh, complex homework with some hundred lines of code, you may uh, start considering abstraction in your solution. Uh, so abstraction is possible in many uh, designs. Uh, uh, we have many uh, examples in engineering, uh, uh, architecture, uh, or any uh, solutions with uh, any problem with complex uh, solutions. We need to provide some so sort of abstraction. Also, anything with a user interface, we have to create those abstractions. And uh, we can also consider uh, programming languages as abstractions as well because the machine code is too complicated that we cannot deal with. So we create a higher level of definition and it's an abstraction over the machine code and, and so on. Purpose of abstraction is due to details are too confusing, details may contain errors, and 
if you repeat the same detail again and again in your code, you repeat the errors. So this is how you uh, make more and more errors as uh, you uh, getting as, as you make your code larger and larger. And we have an important philosophy, which is declare once, use many times. Uh, so this is an essential part of abstraction. Uh, if we implement the detail once, it is reusable. It can be used again and again. So code reusability is our uh, primary goal here uh, in abstraction and later chapter we are going to talk about encapsulation. Um, both have the basic motivation code reusability. Uh, abstraction itself is not uh, generic enough, general enough uh, in order to uh, create varieties of the same abstraction we use parameterization. So we define parameters and each use of the abstraction will be with different parameters behaving differently at the end. Uh, actually, it looks like it's something quite different than you, uh, the things that you know so far, but it is not. Basically, you are using it starting from your first grade. Uh, the functions uh, are user-defined abstractions uh, over the expression. So instead of repeating the same expression again and again, you define a function and you call that function. And that's an abstraction basically. All your algorithms, variables, return values, computation is abstracted into a function body and that function body is just uh, reused each time you call that function. Uh, function call will be the uh, usage of the details, application of the detail uh, and the uh, function body will be uh, the detail. So it is an abstraction over expression basically. Uh, in C, if you define void functions or in Pascal you use procedures or in, or in Fortran you use subroutines, uh, you don't return a value. So whatever your abstraction is, it doesn't have a, a value to be evaluated. Instead, it makes some side effect as we uh, talk about in the previous chapters with uh, commands. In the story chapter, we mentioned commands, if you remember. So actually, uh, the uh, procedures or void functions of C, if you like, are abstractions over commands. Instead of using a loop, for example, you call a procedure a void function doing whatever that loop is doing. Uh, and our next question is, okay, functions, procedures. Is there other type of an abstraction? And the answer is yes, we have uh, for different entities of the programming language, we can create uh, different abstractions. Uh, here comes with an interesting one, which is the selector abstraction. If you define a composite data type like an array or uh, structures as well, you select the members. If you remember, we have Array selection, very simple. You provide an index value. Given the index value, array returns uh, the content of that index. Can we do an abstraction over that? Can we define users, uh, or can user define his or her own abstractions, own selectors? And the answer is yes, programming languages uh, provide ways of doing that. Usually we accustomed to we are accustomed to use the square brackets for index selection. Most of the programming language does that. Uh, some use curly braces for different purposes uh, or parentheses, uh, but we use them. So basically, this is an uh, operator for uh, C plus plus, for example, or most of the languages uh, consider that them as operators. So basically, can we do that? And the answer is yes. Uh, this is an C++ uh, example. Uh, the, the, the details are not important in this code. It is basically just uh, the uh, link this implementation, assume it is complete. And uh, within the uh, link this implementation, we define this operator. This syntax lets us 
uh, use square brackets as an operator getting an uh, integer value and returning a reference to the content of the list. So it will be like this. We have uh, head of the list will be our first value. Uh, L many times we visit the next and at the end we will arrive the data and we return that data. Thanks to this uh, end symbol here in C++, it will be referenced to integer content of that linked this node. And we can use this syntax after that. So what happens now? We have a detailed linked list implementation and we are selecting values out of it. So we created basically a, a selector abstractor over the linked list. Uh, in C++, we do that uh, like this. And this is uh, the Python. In Python, uh, the mechanism is uh, by using the set item and get item. Uh, Python interprets the L value and R value uh, differently with the selectors. So if you use uh, the selector on the left-hand side like this, it will be set item and it gets two parameters the index and the right-hand side expression. Uh, and if it is used in the right-hand side, it is get item with the index value is the only parameter. So if you overload this get item for the given key, you can implement the R value selector. If you implement this one with KM value, you implement L value connector. Uh, details are not important. This is a typical binary search tree implementation. And by using that, you can easily define an abstraction over that. Uh, okay. And this is the C++ counterpart of the same thing. Assume you have a binary search tree implementation uh, defined as a C++ uh, class like this uh, with a node value inside. Uh, and we define our operator to be like this. So we traverse the binary search tree and set the item, uh, return the reference of the uh, value content so that we can use uh, the syntax here as L value and R value, okay. L value, R value. Uh, this L value, R value uh, is provided by, again, this and symbol here. The return value will be a reference. Uh, this way we can have our arbitrary data structures having their selectors. And uh, the nice thing about this selector abstraction is the user of that data structure uh, is using a syntax which is quite convenient. The same syntax uh, that is used for selecting arrays and so on. That's why uh, the programming languages provide this uh, mechanism. Uh, in uh, Python, you can also uh, use set ATTR and get ATTR uh, to uh, overload the member selection. Basically, uh, member selection is uh, something like, for example, if you have a, a data structure or a value, a member, uh, in Python, you can uh, overload get ATTR with, and uh, this definition will get sorry about this. So when you define this, uh, the A member uh, will be passed, uh, the, sorry, get ATTR will be passed, uh, the string, uh, so STR will be 
members uh, inside of your uh, get ATTR method. So it will be uh, overloadable. So there are languages. So my, my point is there are languages also overloading this selector. This is another selector you can overload. Uh, now let us uh, skip to the next uh, type of abstraction. Uh, abstraction or expressions, comments, selectors. What about declarations? Can we abstract the declarations? That means when you do some complex declaration, can you just uh, uh, can you just, um, instead of repeating that complex declaration, can you declare it once and reuse any times you like? So for different uh, scenarios, you repeat the same declaration by only calling something. And this is called generic abstraction. Uh, probably you are familiar uh, from data structure courses. Uh, the templates of C++ are uh, an example of this. Uh, so uh, the template is a generic body. So when you uh, instantiate it, the declaration is some sort of repeated for each uh, different data types, at least in C++ it is like that. So for example, a linked list uh, declaration doesn't have to be repeated for integers, doubles, structures, and other data types. You provide one linked list implementation and given an arbitrary data type, that declaration is expanded as you uh, instantiate it. And this is how you instantiate that. So this code here, you'll instantiate for integers, double, and person. Also, same thing calls for uh, functions as well. A swap function is a generic function. For arbitrary data type, you may need uh, swapping. Once you define this swap, uh, used for integers, doubles person, it is going to be generated again and again. So you create a generic abstraction that is uh, useful for different data types. Another abstraction is the iterator. Uh, this is a common uh, abstraction in object-oriented languages and script languages mostly. Uh, so this is a Ruby example. It is not much interesting, so I am skipping it and I will give you the Python. You are more familiar with the Python case. Uh, so uh, the idea here is I have a binary search tree and I would like to traverse all of the elements and once I traverse it I would like to do something with the um, values uh, I get from the traverse and uh, I will not go uh, into more detail what this yield has uh, some meaning here, it will return you something we call generator. And at the end, you can use this syntax. And this is our primary objective here. By this syntax, now given an arbitrary data structure by the user, you can iterate over it. Uh, let us see the same example in C++. In C++, we have uh, the iterator data type. Uh, but uh, most importantly, more importantly, we have begin and end. Uh, so once you uh, implement begin and end, also this plus plus operator, uh, you can use this syntax here. Uh, the iterator data type, whatever it is, you define that. It starts from a begin and until it is a dot end, as long as it is not equal to a dot end, you increment the iterator. Uh, in this syntax, if you provide uh, the plus plus operators, compar comparison operators, begin and end, uh, the loop body will be repeated for each occurrence of this. As a result, you will end up in an iterator. In C++11, uh, they came up with a better syntax, which is basically this one. Uh, easier to read and define. So for the value type reference I column A, so this is your data structure, binary search if you like, or any other trivial arbitrary data structure, you can 
repeat the same body for all of the elements returned by the iterator. These two uh, syntax are basically equivalent. So let me show you uh, my C++ example. It is quite crowded uh, code. Uh, you can analyze that on your own. But the idea here is uh, by implementing this iterator data type, this one class iterator, uh, increment operator, not equal operator, begin and end. Uh, this is linked this case. This syntax will work for each element of the uh, linked list. It is going to do this operation. Also, uh, if you like, you can implement this dereference operator so that given the iterator, it will give you uh, the actual reference. Uh, this syntax will work. Also, uh, in this new C++, uh, 11 and new standards, uh, this syntax is possible. It looks like uh, a little bit strange to you. You are not familiar with uh, C++, but the idea is uh, this uh, curly brace uh, syntax is converted into uh, some sort of vector like HDL data structure and the iterators are already defined for them, so this syntax will work. So now uh, we have this abstraction principle um, defined in uh, the Watts book. If any programming language entity involves some sort of computation, we can define an abstraction over it. Of course, we don't have to, but if it is convenient, if it helps us, we can uh, define an abstraction for that. So uh, expressions, functions, commands, procedures, selectors, selected functions, declarations, generic abstraction, and repeated command blocks, iterators. So now we have uh, another essential part of the abstraction, which is parameters. Without parameters, the abstractions are like simple macros uh, that you uh, expand each time you use it. And it does exactly the same thing without parameterization. So each time you use abstraction, it will do the same thing. It is not only boring, but not useful at all. So the idea is this, if you are going to go over this declare once used many times, you have to do, uh, each time you use it, you may like to have a different behavior. And basically it is done by this parameterization. In the declaration part, we use formal parameters. And in the use part, we have actual parameters. Uh, you should have some sort of matching between actual and formal parameters and at the end, uh, each time we use it with a different actual parameter set, we will have a different behavior. Uh, so in the uh, declaration part, the formal parameters are usually identifiers. Uh, and uh, in the functional languages, it can be patterns as well. Like your Haskell experience, you, if you remember, uh, we can have constructs with mat pattern matching and unification. Uh, the actual parameters are uh, expressions usually, and sometimes they may need to be L values, and they need to have some uh, type match between the formal and actual parameters. And we have an important question coming up with that. How those parameters, actual and formal, interact with each other? And uh, the designer should answer that question, and it is called parameter passing mechanisms. So now we are going to uh, talk about parameter passing mechanisms available in programming languages. Actually, we have three uh, main uh, mechanisms. Copy mechanism, which is based on assignment. Binding mechanism, which is based on the binding. So if you remember, uh, binding of identifiers. So the parameters are uh, passed through binding. And third one is an irregular one, actually, which is passed by name. The mechanism is called substitution. So the actual parameters are substituted in place of the formal parameters. And the copy mechanism, uh, we have the assignment, actual and formal parameters. And there are three positions or three ways of doing that. In the copy in case, the actual parameters, the values that you use in the call part are passed to the 
definition part by assignment, or you can call it initialization as well. So uh, we have a reverse of this, which is not much common. Uh, on return, the actual parameters, the definition, uh, are assigned by the form parameter in the definition. So this is used for getting value mm -hmm. out of the function, not into the function. Uh, and we can do both of them. In the both of them case, on entry, we make an assignment in the input direction and uh, on return, we do assignments in the output direction. So caller to function on entry, function to caller on return. Uh, actually, you are familiar with this mechanism, but one of them, uh, which is a uh, copy in mechanism, which is default in C. C programming language only provides pass by value or copy in mechanism. The common name for it is the pass by value. So it works like this uh, on uh, entry. So this X and Y are assigned to A and B. So initially, X and Y are one and two, and they are assigned to A and B. Then nothing happens in terms of parameter passing. The rest is uh, traced as usual. X is incremented by A plus one, and it will become four. A is incremented by one, it will become two. B is divided by two, and so on. And on return, nothing happens. The values of A and B are simply lost, and your trace will output this. Let us uh, try copy out case. But for copy out, we have a problem, the initial values of AB. We will make an assumption the initial values of A and B will be zero. On entry, nothing happens. X and Y are there, and A and B are default values, whatever they are. Uh, and after you trace, at the end, when you hit here, when you find one and zero for A and B, you make an assignment on the reverse direction. B is assigned to Y, A is assigned to X. As a result, you will end up in this value. This is called copying out. Uh, copy out, sorry. Sorry, this is called copy out. And uh, when you combine both of them, which is more common, by the way, makes more sense because A and B have an uh, initial value. So X is passed to A, Y is passed to B. So we have assignment. They, executed, the function body is executed, then two is assigned back to x, one is assigned back to one. Uh, so this is copying in a in out uh, mechanism. The second main mechanism is the, uh, by the way, uh, copy in, copy out, copy in out, uh, and uh, one of the mechanisms here are available in ADA. ADA is a rich language in terms of that. You can use versions of, different versions of that for different parameters. Uh, in out are keywords that you can use so that you can trigger this uh, in out and var you can trigger them uh, by you can choose any parameter passing mechanism in c we only have copy in which is passed by name uh, sorry passed by value uh, the binding mechanism is the second uh, primary mechanism if you remember uh, the binding uh, problem uh, the identifiers are bound to the color values on entry and it is not the assignment it is binding we have two versions one is constant binding in the constant binding the parameter does not change parameter is not allowed to change and the binding works as usual uh, this is the default mechanism of haskell in most of the functional languages because functional languages have their variables uh, remain uh, constant once they define and the definition based on the parameter passing uh, the variable binding, uh, the parameter can change so that this binding is like uh, during the function invocation, the parameter and the color uh, parameter are the same variable. They are bound to the same storage, same variable. Uh, that's why we call that pass by reference also. So we pass this reference, so the reference is used, that means uh, the parameter and the actual uh, parameter are modifying the same location. 
basically. Uh, this is available in C++ in addition to test file value and also in ADA. Uh, and this is default in uh, comp composite values for uh, Python, Java, and uh, languages like that. For primitive values, pass by value. For objects, uh, Python and Java uses pass by reference. Uh, the other entities like functions, etc., remaining constant are also uh, passed by this mechanism. So this is the variable binding or pass or pass by reference. The idea is this one: uh, x, y, a, b. So when you call f x, y, a and b will be x and y during the function body. So it will be like this: a and x will be the same, b and y will be the same. So if you trace that, x will be incremented by a plus b, and a is incremented by 1. a is incremented by 1 occurs here, or uh, b is changed occurs here, and the exact same location of y. As a result, you will end up in this. On exit, you will lose the binding, and you will have this one. Uh, so as you can see, we have different result from copying out to one with this one. Reason is, if you look carefully, you will see that there is a global variable which is bound to the parameter. So changing global variable affects this, changing A affects this, so you will end up in multiple increments of the same thing. Uh, so pass by name is uh, uh, more controversial uh, parameter passing mechanism, if you like, uh, because it is based on substitution, it is based on expansion, and expansion is in the syntactic level, some sort of, that means the code is repeated uh, each time you uh, use that parameter. Uh, the closest thing you may think uh, about pass by name is the C macros. C macros are defined by something we call preprocessor, and uh, the macro invocation uh, parameters are expanded in position, or macro body is expanded uh, with the parameters. Uh, so uh, if uh, we should give an example, uh, we can give this Haskell example, but Haskell doesn't use this. Uh, the importance of pass by name comes from this normal order evaluation, which is about the theoretical part of the programming languages. So it works like that. Assume you have this function defined in Haskell. Our primary mechanism and only mechanism is the substitution and expansion. That means if I call this function with this, each time I see x, I substitute 3 times 12 plus 7. Each time I see y, I am going to expand 24 plus 16 times 3. So your function body will be expanded into this form, this form. X is substitute by this expression, Y is substitute by this expression. And you apply, apply multiple reductions, multiple uh, computations, evaluations of the same expression, you will hit into this point. This will end up in false. And this will end up in this expression. Because it is false, it will go this as part, which contains only x's. And then you will evaluate to 1892. And it needs 12 steps for evaluation. We have some interesting thing here. We are going to revisit that later. In 12 steps, we hit here. So the evolution order is uh, some uh, our next concern. But before that, I would like to uh, give you some hint about different evolution orders and how they work. So I prepared an example for you. This is pass by value. Uh, copy and mechanism, basically very similar to your example. And if you like to trace this code, simply write it down 
and compile it and work. Uh, C uses passby value. So compiling this code and execute this will end up in passby value evaluation of the uh, parameters at P4, X4 at the end. If you like, uh, or pass by reference is easier for the time being. Uh, you need to use C and you should replace this integers by int ampersand so that it will be passed by reference. That means any changes on A will be on P, any changes on B will be on X. And in this way, uh, increments of X will affect B, increments of B or changes on B will affect X. And at the end, you will have this trace for 14. X is incremented much more times because A and X are the same value. For uh, In out mechanism, it is a little bit complicated. I am using a trick here. I am passing something by reference and initialize A and A and B based on that reference here. So they are initialized from A and A R and B R, which are the, the our original uh, references. And just before returning, I do this. I assign A and B back to A R and B R. And as a result, I will end up in this one. Uh, so at, on exit, the access value is written back in, so for P. Uh, pass by name is a, a little bit tricky. I don't define it as a function, so this is my usual function. Instead, I define it as a macro. Uh, uh, this macro will end up in expanding. So uh, in order to illustrate the change, I added this plus plus P here. So instead of sending only P, I have plus plus P. Since my mechanism is substitution, each time I use this A, the plus plus P will be expanded and it will end up in a different value as you will see here, X is 18, which is much more larger than test by reference. And P value is much more larger because of this and many increments. Uh, in order to illustrate test by name, I'm going to show you this E flag of GCC. Oh, let us use G++. It doesn't uh, matter for preprocessors. This will invoke preprocessor and give you the output to standard output. It will expand your code. It will expand all of the includes, macros, and so on. All of the this hash uh, uh, syntax of the uh, C++ will be executed. And this is our code. Actually, the rest is about includes. Do not care for them, but our function call is turning out into this. When printing it, plus plus p, x is assigned to plus plus p, x is assigned to x plus 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 p plus x, plus plus p are plus plus. And at the end, even at the end, it makes another plus plus. And that's why you, you have a larger p as a result. And this is how pass by name works. So uh, going back to our slide, uh, the uh, pass by name works like this, by substitution, and it is one of the evolution orders. So this will give us a, uh, another uh, problem in the programming languages, which is in which order we are going to evaluate our functions. And this is called normal order evaluation. And we have uh, different evaluation orders. And eager evaluation is commonly 
adopted by most of the programming languages, like 99% of the uh, well-known programming languages, because it is efficient somehow. And I'm going to show it in a moment. The same function and the same expression. In eager evaluation, the philosophy is very simple. Evaluate uh, the parameter into uh, its normal form that cannot be reduced anymore, and then pass it. So basically, we start with the uh, actual parameters passed. Evaluate them first. So we will go to this one. And after a couple of steps, we will get to this. So that this 43 and 72 cannot be reduced anymore. Then we expand the function body. So it will be much more smaller. And then in eight steps compared to 12 steps here, we find exactly the same results. But we have a, uh, we have an important uh, problem coming with this. First of all, normal order uh, evaluation comes from math. So it is mathematically natural way of reducing an expression. Uh, however, in eager evaluation, we uh, change something. And that something can be illustrated here. If we have this expression, and if we call that with that parameter, with those parameters, what will happen? In a normal order evaluation, this GXY so G will be expanded as G2 4 over 0. And it is going to be expanded as if 2 is greater than 10, then 4 over 0 else 2. So it, this is a new uh, expression here we have. And if you uh, reduce this right hand side, you will see that this is false. As a result, you will end up in two. So the result of this expression is basically two. G2, four over zero is two. And if you consider eager evaluation, what happens? Eager evaluation will try to reduce this two first and four over zero. And what happens? Four over zero has no value. A runtime error division by zero. So eager evaluation cannot evaluate this expression. On the other hand, the normal order evaluation it has a value. So eager evaluation has some problem with mathematical natural way of evaluating the expression. Uh, also, another difference, which is uh, important difference, is the side effects are repeated in normal order evaluation. So, if your language has side effects like plus plus of C, or it is making an IO, or in a random number generator, it is updating some global data, global state, the normal order evaluation will avoid a different value. So if you like your programming language to be math compatible somehow, mathematically verifiable, uh, you need to have some, um, you need to at least uh, restrict some of the expressions with runtime errors and side effects, uh, or you should have some property. It is called Church-Russell property and says that uh, if, an expression can be evaluated at all. It can be evaluated by consistently using normal order evaluation. If an expression can be evaluated in several different orders in your language, you can mix them. All of these evaluation orders yield the same result. Uh, so this uh, tells us about mathematical verifiability of uh, our program language. Uh, actually, I have shown uh, the slide in my section, uh, uh, which is about lambda calculus. As you can see, uh, if you go into details of that, 
at each step one of these lambda expressions are evaluated but there are three options here after you go here there are two options here etc but at the end they will evaluate to same expression but this is uh, the basics of this church russell property uh, functional languages uh, at least uh, the Haskell or normal relating languages conform that. But we have some uh, efficiency constraint: 18 steps versus 8 steps. Assume I have a, I am a programming language designer. I would like to have normal order evaluation uh, possible, and I would like to evaluate expressions and with the same values with normal order evaluation. But efficiency is a concern. I cannot. Uh, tolerate inefficiency, you have to implement something we call lazy evaluation. Pascal does that. Uh, so the idea here is uh, the problem of uh, normal order evaluation comes with repetition of the computation. It repeats the computation, so as a result, you will end up in 12 steps because you are evaluating this 3 times 12 plus 7, 1, 2, Three times. Uh, if you uh, consider this one four times instead of once. And lazy evaluation deals with that. Uh, what it does is it will uh, label the expressions. It expands like a normal order evaluation, but it labels all of the expressions with the parameter names. And once one of the expressions, one of the parameters are evaluated, its value is substituted in all occurrences. So this evaluation of 43 for the first time, evaluation of X is used in or remembered in the other occurrences of X. So now X is resolved, X is a value. So it doesn't have to be re-evaluated, re-computed. And it will end up in seven steps. Why? Because if you are careful, I didn't evaluate this 24 plus 16 times 3. So it is sometimes efficient, more efficient than the evaluation because it doesn't evaluate some of the expressions. Since it doesn't evaluate all of the expressions, it can also evaluate this one as well. So in Haskell, I can show you this. So so g x y is if x is less than uh, greater than 10 then y as x uh, if you ask this question all well, zero you will get a value uh, but in c you will get the runtime error because of eager evaluation. Uh, however, uh, lazy evaluation is not easy to implement. You have to uh, keep this uh, symbols in the function body and resolve them. Uh, their storage locations have to be uh, accounted and so on. Uh, if you are interested in, we can go uh, further uh, into implementation. Uh, I have this slide, but uh, it is not uh, essential part of the course, but if you're interested, you can read it. It is called the Tank. This is a Python implementation. It is actually Python simulation of lazy evaluation. Instead of passing this uh, 3 times 32 plus 4, I pass a lambda here so that the execution of this expression will be delayed. And in the body, I check. Uh, all functions has attributes in Python. So if it is already computed, I return that value. Otherwise, I uh, call that function. First time I need it, I call that function. And once it is successful, I uh, record the result and reuse it. Uh, if you're interested, then you can ask me about these questions and I can explain it in detail. Uh, the lazy evaluation uh, will help us in something in uh, Haskell. We can deal with infinite values thanks to that. So if you remember our uh, uh, 
example uh, in one of the earlier lectures the x being defined to this value is complete low k in ASCAP, so we can have that. So it's an infinite value. The other programming languages cannot uh, deal with that. So the nice thing is, if I take, for example, five value i for this x, it will give you five value. If you ask 50 value out of this x, it will give you 50 value. You can ask, what is, what is the this value? And it will give you two. So in this way, you can deal with infinite values thanks to lazy uh, evaluation. Okay. Uh, so let us see how it is possible. So this is the expansion of take, and this is my infinite value. If I evaluate this take 3x, it will expand into the uh, this form because it is x, and it will expand into uh, by the way, this is also a possible normal order evaluation. Uh, nothing fancy about lazy evaluation instead of normal order. This is also a feature of normal order. So this will be expanded as, so this call uh, uh, will be expanded as uh, thanks to this one. So this one matches uh, this otherwise case and is not zero. Otherwise case is expanded as this one. So this uh, second step is expanded as a being one, and the rest is take n minus one. The rest of the parameter is two x. And it is expanded as this one. It is expanded as this one. And now I need to evaluate this take one, one, two x. And how do I do that? I simply will get uh, 1 minus 1, and it is expanded as 1 to 1, and that's it. Okay. Um, in this example, I don't need uh, the x's value again, but if you need it so, uh, you expand it. So x is expanded into 1 to x on demand during evolution. If you need it, you expand it. Otherwise, you don't need the full evaluation of the x, thanks to uh, this normal order or lazy evaluation. Uh, we can take advantage of it. We can infinite value, construct and take values out of like pi value calculation and so on. Or more importantly, we can have, for example, a network channel providing us messages. And it is like an infinite list. And thanks to lazy binding, we can deal with that infinite list in our code. So as the last thing for abstraction, we have a principle that we call correspondence principle. Uh, we have, uh, so this is not something essential, very really important, but intuitively a programmer may expect this. If there is a uh, form of declaration, we can also expect a corresponding parameter passing mechanism. Like in C, we have, for example, a definition as a declaration parameter, and it is corresponding to uh, pass by value or constant declaration has a constant parameter passing. Uh, in Pascal, we have uh, a variable declaration and we have pass by value constant, but there is no constant parameter. Uh, we have a pass by reference, but there is no declare by reference. On the other hand, in C, we have as by reference and declare by reference. So A and P are the same variable. You don't create a new variable, but A and P are the same variable. So this is some, something intuitive. You have better have it, but if you don't, you have a reason. So this is the case in the usual in, in most of the programming languages. Uh, so this is uh, our last slide. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, during the week, we will make an interactive session about uh, the examples of uh, those. Uh, if you like to note the, okay, uh, I can share uh, the programs with you uh, also. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Uh,
See you later.